Hello, um, Alan, thank you for joining. This meeting is now also streaming live on YouTube. Hello, um, Alan. Hi, Alan. How are you? Hi, very good. Good. I haven't seen you in ages. Do we? Do, sorry, do we know each other? Oh, yes, I think from the hospital. From the hospital. Right. Club. I was about to say yes. I do recognise you. Yeah, yes. yeah. I didn't used to have glasses. This is just for the computer. Uh, that's me. <laughs> Yes, it's actually shut down as far as I remember. Yes, yeah, sadly, yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm I'm going to uh, focus on um, on admitting the other uh, attendees if there are some. Looking at whether everything is okay with YouTube, and thank you so much for joining, Alan. Fantastic, thank yeah. you. Stay put, please. Thank you. All right. Okay, so I think we're going to get cracking since uh, it's um, um, five thirty, and um, I see that some of um, of you have joined directly on uh, on YouTube Live, um, and um, and so let's let's get going. So the first point I wanted to uh, 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 discuss today in relation to exhaustion of rights. Uh, is what is the current state of play in relation to exhaustion of rights and parallel imports um, post-Brexit? Well, first, we need to have a look at the definition of exhaustion of rights, which is a concept which is also referred to sometimes as, as the first cell doct doctrine. So it is one of the mechanisms to strike the balance between incentivizing creativity and innovation by um, making sure that intellectual property rights, so copyright, trademarks, patents, design rights, so um, making sure that these packages of intellectual property rights are um, strongly protected and therefore uh, creators have uh, and content content creators have an incentive to be even more creative and innovative. So this is the first objective that a country a territory wants to achieve. But also there is another objective, which which is that you, uh, uh, this territory, this nation, it needs also to have competition. If intellectual property rights are so strong that it is impossible to for for um, any competitor to um, take inspiration or do some competitive products, then this is not good for uh, creating a competition in a, in, a, in a market. So therefore, the concept of exhaust, exhaustion of rights is one of the mechanisms to strike the right balance between incentivizing creativity and innovation and enabling more competition consumers' choices and access to goods. Uh, so while owners of intellectual property rights can control distribution of a creation in terms of the first sale of a product, the principle of exhaustion of rights is that it puts some limits on how far that control extends. So let me give you an, an example of exhaustion of right. Well, once goods have been placed on a particular market by a rights holder, an intellectual property rights holder, with uh, their consent or, or with a consent, then this rights holder cannot then assert their intellectual property rights to prevent the onward sale of these goods onto into this territory. So if you have bought a book, the owner of the copyright in that book cannot then stop you from selling this book to another person in the same territory. And that is an example 
a tangible example of the principle of exhaust, exhaustion of rights. So exhaustion of rights needs to be also um, linked to the concept of parallel trade, because parallel trade is the cross-border movement of genuine, not counterfeited um, uh, goods, physical goods, that have already been put on the market. This is the import and the export of intellectual property protected goods that have already been sold in a specific market. And um, as a res result of the exhaustion of rights, when the intellectual property rights relate to this, this, relating to these goods have been exhausted, there will be an opportunity for others to engage in the parallel trade of those goods. So for example, a distributor moves a good that has been sold in Germany to import that good into the United Kingdom. This is an example of parallel trade. And in this particular example, that would be a parallel export from Germany to the UK. And there's another, the other way around would be, I'm going to admit Stacy who's just joining us. Hello, Stacy. Hello. Hello, I'll let you come in into your own good time. So coming back to a concept of parallel trade, a parallel import would be when um, uh, the UK um, receives these goods from Germany. So that is a parallel import because it's coming into the UK. And the parallel export would be when the UK um, uh, basically transfers some goods to Germany. That's a parallel export. So what was the, um, the, the regime in relation to exhaustion of rights uh, prior to uh, Brexit? Well, pre-Brexit, the UK used to be part of the uh, European Economic Area-wide exhaustion of rights regional regime. So let me just uh, refresh your memory here and clarify what the uh, European uh, economic area is. Well, uh, as I'm sure you remember, uh, uh, there are the uh, uh, pre-Brexit, there were 28 member states of uh, the European Union. So that's including the UK, obviously. And in addition to these 28 member states, uh, there were also some uh, uh, additional um, uh, treaties entered into with three other countries, um, which are namely uh, Iceland, Liechtenstein, and Norway. And the 28 member states of the European Union, plus these three EEA states, so Liechtenstein, Norway, and, um, and, um, uh, and um, Oh, I'm, I'm missing one that I just told you, but I'm missing the, and Iceland, sorry, they create the EEA, okay? And so, um, as I just stated, pre-Brexit, the UK, obviously, being a, one of the 28 member states of the European Union, was a, uh, uh, had access to this, uh, to this uh, European economic area, um, uh, regional, uh, a place where to, to trade. And so, of course, I was going both ways pre-Brexit in the sense that the UK could do some parallel exports towards EEA countries. And also um, the UK could uh, have some uh, parallel imports from those EEA countries coming to the UK. So it was going both ways. So all, all, all in all, a fantastic a fantastic regime for which which is in in absolute compliance with a, a freedom of uh, of goods uh, a, a principle uh, which is enshrined in the in in, in the uh, in the eu various treaties so however post brexit and since the uh, 31st of december 2021 the regime as in, in relation to exhaustion of rights has changed in the uk how has it changed? Well, while the UK is still part of this EEA-wide exhaustion of uh, rights national regional regime, it can now only um, uh, get some parallel exports from the EEA. 
Now, post-Brexit, and as per the withdrawal uh, agreement that has been entered into with uh, the EU uh, member states, the UK can only receive genuine goods from the EEA through this, uh, uh, from this ex exhaustion of rights um, regime. And so this unilateral, unilateral system is called the UK plus exhaustion of right regime. And I repeat again, now the UK cannot um, do some parallel exports of its own goods within the EEA as per this new regime. However, it can receive through parallel imports the EEA goods uh, on its territory, on uh, the UK territory. So this is the agreement, the current agreement, which has been struck by this current UK government and also the, um, uh, the EU Commission and Parliament. Um, so obviously this is not an ideal situation uh, because, because um, now UK businesses cannot do, uh, cannot reciprocate, they cannot parallel exports their own products to this wide market, which is the 27 remaining member states of the EU, plus Liechtenstein, Iceland, and, and Norway. Um, so the UK government has decided to mandate, instruct the UK Intellectual Property Office, the UK IPO, to, um, to basically conduct a consultation with UK businesses on this new exhaustion of rights regime and, um, and how the UK government could potentially change it to make it more attuned to the needs of UK businesses. Because at the end of the day, um, the UK is no longer a member state of the EU, therefore it can decide uh, as a free, free agent, so to speak, to, um, to, to change the paradigm in relation to um, exhaustion of rights and, uh, and uh, parallel trade. So how is that effort going uh, of changing the paradigm and, um, and how is, what's, what's been happening with this consultation? Well, um, so one thing to note is that the, uh, the UK IPO has also um, mandated the Ernest & Young um, uh, to uh, draft a feasibility study on changing the, par the exhaustion of rights regime in the UK. So I strongly suggest that you have a read because it's really a, a, a useful um, uh, preparation to this consultation, which concluded in August, 2021, and through which the UK Intellectual Property Office, the UK IPO collated quite a lot of information. So 150 um, respondents, responded to the consultation, uh, which is not a lot, to be honest. I'm sure the UKPO was expecting more, more traction, more, more, um, more, more feedback from UK businesses on that consultation, but only 150 replied. Most of them were coming from the creative industries and, and m mostly also from the, um, uh, from the mass pharmaceutical sectors. And um, um, in this consultation, four possible options were under consideration. So the first one was this UK plus um, EEA wide regime, which we, we just discussed and, and explained to maintain the status quo. So the option number one would be UK plus to maintain the, uh, the status quo. And therefore that would be a continuation of a current unilateral application of this EEA wide regional exhaustion of rights regime in the UK. That's option one. Option two would be national exhaustion regime, which is um, a regime where only goods put on the market in the UK could flow around the UK. And so goods put on the market in any other country, European or otherwise, could be stopped from entering the UK market 
by relying upon UK intellectual property rights. So that's the most stringent uh, uh, um, uh, option. Then option three was, is the international exhaustion uh, of rights regime, which where the goods put in the market, on the market in any country, anywhere in the world, could be automatically parallel imported in the UK and intellectual property rights could not be asserted to prevent the first sale of that product in the United Kingdom. So this is in, in, in strict, like in complete opposition to the national exhaustion regime. That would be the, uh, the uh, other end of a pendant of a spectrum where it's actually completely free as, as, as soon as an, a, a good has been um, put on the first market anywhere in the world, then it can enter the, uh, the UK. So that's called the international exhaustion regime. And then option four uh, is actually a mixed regime uh, and uh, and which which would be basically a, um, a sort of copy or inspired at least by uh, the mixed regime which uh, uh, exists in Switzerland. As I'm sure you know, Switzerland is not part of the European Union, and it's also not part of the EEA, this European Economic Area I just mentioned. Instead, Switzerland has access to the European si single market through various bilateral agreements entered into with the EU. And within those bilateral agreements, the uh, Switzerland has actually decided to put in place a mixed regime of exhaustion of, of rights. So in particular for um, pharmaceutical products, because as I'm sure you know, um, Switzerland has got many pharmaceutical companies, big, big pharmaceutical companies, so for pharmaceutical companies, products, sorry, uh, there would be a sort of a national regime of exhaustion of rights in place. So only those um, pharmaceutical products put in um, Switzerland, uh, on, the, uh, uh, on the market of Switzerland first could actually circulate freely around Switzerland. But for other uh, goods, which are not pharmaceutical products, then it's actually a, um, a sort of UK plus, uh, uh, like it's the equivalent of a UK plus regime, which applies, which is that it, there's, a, there's a, the, the EEA goods can enter Switzerland. So this mixed regime, um, yeah, is in place in uh, in, in Switzerland. So the, through the, uh, this consultation, the UK government was asking uh, respondents, what do you think of that? Shall we go for a Switzerland-inspired um, uh, exhaustion of rights regime? So um, from the outset, the UK IPO clarified in the consultation that even though it had mentioned this second option of a national regime of exhaustion of rights, it was, in any case, this national regime incompatible with the Northern Ireland protocol. And as such, the UK IPO from the outset of the consultation ruled out adopting that option of a national regime of exhaustion of rights. So when I read that, I was like, what, what is that Northern Ireland protocol? What does it have to do with anything? So let me give you some context, but please uh, follow me on, the, on this one and, uh, and, and kindly, can you bear with me so that, uh, so that we can backtrack and explain what this, this thing about the Northern Ireland protocol uh, is all about. So as with the rest of the UK, Northern Ireland adopted the same UK EE, uh, a wide re regional exhaustion of rights regime uh, from the 31st of December 2020 onwards, obviously, since it is part of the United Kingdom. Therefore, goods can uh, flow freely from the EU member state island or from anywhere else in the EEA, for that matter, into Northern Ireland without intellectual property rights holders um, being able to enforce their rights. This is one of the principles of the Northern Ireland Protocol, along with the provision that certain EU legislation must be adopted in Northern Ireland to enable goods to flow around the geographical territory that is the island of uh, Iceland, sorry, the island of Ireland. So, so um, 
both in and out of Northern Ireland. So basically the conundrum in which the UK go government and the EU are is that they can't have some goods which are accessible in Ireland, I-R-E-L-A-N-D, but not in Northern Ireland. So they need to freely flow in, the, in this whole island, which is the, the, the I island. So anyway, it's a bit complicated, but basically as part of the, um, uh, so notwithstanding the Northern Ireland protocol, rights holders in Ireland can still enforce the intellectual property right to stop their goods from being put on the market in Northern Ireland, flowing into the EU member state island. So now that we've clarified what this Northern Ireland protocol is and why therefore it rules out the national exhaustion of rights regime, what happened with the, um, out, uh, with the, 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 with the outcome of this consultation? Um, so in the summary of responses to the consultation that the UKIPO um, released on its website, we learn that most of its 150 respondents stated that there was some parallel trade of goods, materials and products, uh, which was happening in their respective sector. So they know it, it, it occurs. Um, however, the responses on the impact of parallel imports from the EEA um, on organizations depended on whether such, such respondents were dependent on commercializing parallel traded goods or whether those respondents were or represented rights holders. So for these respondents who were um, commercializing parallel traded goods, such as pharmaceutical distributors in the UK, for example, they commented that parallel imports from the EEA ben benefited the organization because they contributed to a greater choice of suppliers to source goods from that could in turn be made available to customers at different price points. And in fact, the NHS, as you can read in the AN, uh, Ernest & Young report I mentioned before, the NHS makes great use of this flexibility by uh, sourcing a lot of its products from the EEA. Um, in addition, these various uh, UK businesses dependent on uh, parallel traded goods also and emphasized the availability, flexibility, and security of supply of goods to support market demand and alleviate supply shortages. And finally, um, they also thought that a competitive market, especially in intra-brand competition among suppliers of the same branded product, uh, encouraged price convergence. So these were the respondents who were pro um, exhaustion of rights and uh, parallel, uh, parallel trade. And then there were the other uh, category of respondents to a consultation who were either the right owners or representatives or right owners, right hol uh, uh, holders such as brand owners and, um, and they, they uh, lawyers, etc. So these ones, these respondents replied that parallel imports did not increase choice by providing a greater number of different goods because parallel imports tended to be products already available or approved in the UK, especially licensed branded goods, such as branded toys and branded medicines. Also, um, we can supply chain resilience due to fluctuations in supply and cost, making demand forecasting particularly difficult for brand owners was one of the, um, um, of the downsides of parallel imports. And according to them, to this category of respondents, and um, also, um, they thought that parallel imports did not always drive competition for the benefit of a consumer, but mainly benefited distributors and resellers. So, as you can see, there was really a dichotomy uh, of, of responses, depending on which interest um, these respondents had at, at, at heart. Um, I think that to get to the crux of this uh, consultation, what is interesting is that the consensus was um, we would prefer to have a national regime uh, of exhaustion of rights. This is what most respondents said. Um, however, because of the Northern Ireland protocol situation, 
the um, least the, the, uh, the least damaging necessary evil is a continuation of a UK plus EEA wide regional exhaustion of rights regime. So this is what the majority of respondents said. If we had it our way, we would much rather prefer to have national exhaustion of rights, where basically you can only have UK goods uh, flowing freely in the UK. But because of this Northern Ireland protocol thing, well, let's, let, let's stick to the, uh, this, this uh, unilateral application of a UK-wide regime. So this is where we stand right now. This is the current state of play. And these are the findings of a UK consultation I just mentioned. So what, how, what, how, what, how has the UK government reacted to that? Well, by doing nothing. They just share the consultation. <laughs> I see some of you actually laughing. They just uh, share the consultation and issued a statement on the UK IPO's website saying further development of the policy framework must take place before the issue is reconsidered. You can read between the lines. What they mean is until we have sorted this Northern Ireland thing, we cannot move on this. We cannot change anything in relation to the exhaustion of rights regime because we've got Northern Ireland, this Northern Ireland situation to deal with first. And also they want to have, uh, I think, more um, historical data in relation to how this withdrawal agreement from the EU um, um, works in practice. I think that the UK government is still thinking that it's quite early days to, um, to change anything in relation to the exhaustion of rights because they have uh, more um, pressing matters to deal with, uh, uh, some priorities uh, which are, are more important, such as dealing with the Northern Ireland protocol situation and also making sure that um, the uh, withdrawal agreement is executed uh, in a smooth manner. Uh, between the UK and um, and uh, the um, the EU, so where does uh, I mean where does this leave us um, us uh, you know uh, uh, residents in the UK people who, are, who live in the UK and also want to make sure that the UK remains a competitive and uh, trade friendly and exports focused nation. What, what, what can we do? What is the future in relation to this, uh, to this uh, exhaustion of rights regime in the UK? Well, um, at the moment, my take is that the UK plus regime is, um, is inappropriate for the UK because it is only a unilateral application of the um, EEA wide exhaustion of right re of rights regional uh, regime. So while EEA countries can actually freely f uh, send their own goods into the UK, well, the um, reciprocal is not correct. UK businesses cannot free flow their own uh, products to the EEA, which as I'm sure you know, is a massive market. Yeah, it's 27 member states of the EU plus Liechtenstein, uh, the, uh, Iceland and uh, Norway and also Switzerland. So as a consequence of that, more than 400 UK businesses have actually relocated from the UK to the, uh, to the European Union. Uh, I've, uh, in my article that I released um, last week on uh, exhaustion of right, there is a link to an excellent um, article by, uh, issued by um, a uh, Scottish newspaper on this point. So either they have completely severed ties with the UK and moved to the EU, or as I um, anticipated they would do back in 2016, just after a Brexit was voted, just after the Brexit referendum was released, um, they actually set up a manufacturing plant or a um, subsidiary in um, one of the uh, 27 member states of the EU, where they could basically manufacture the uh, EU, uh, EU, EU goods. So this is one of the consequences, but think about the, the cost of, of such, uh, of such um, uh, a system. 
this is very expensive for, uh, you know, rent wise, um, accounting wise, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. But why does the UK accept this situation of this unilateral application of the uh, EEA wide regional exhaustion of right regime, because it is trapped the UK is not a strong manufacturing country. It's not like Germany, which you know is uh, uh, a, a fantastic country in terms of uh, of uh, exports be, be, uh, due to uh, the quality of its of its goods and also the um, um, longevity and the efficiency of its of its German goods. So the UK has all in all quite a, a weak manufacturing sector, and and a lot of UK businesses and also customers, of course, rely on materials and products coming from the EEA to either uh, product, create their own products or, uh, or consume them. So the UK is not in a position to, to bargain hard with the uh, uh, EU and in, with the EEA um, requesting right now the risk sorry, the reciprocity of this um, EA-wide exhaustion of right regime, um, because there's no bilateral trade agreements in place between the EEA, the EU, and, um, and the UK for now. So while the UK, as I said, is extremely reliant on all these imports of goods coming from the EEA. So my take is that, <laughs> Uh, the UK is getting all the disadvantages of, uh, of uh, a post-Brexit situation and none of the advantages. Um, and um, the situation cannot go on forever. I mean, in a very trivial manner, I can already notice that now when I um, um, order some goods on Amazon, and a lot of them come from Europe, like the European Union, they don't come from the UK, they're not sourced to me from, uh, to me from the UK. Now they take three or four weeks to arrive while um, during the two um, uh, lockdowns in, 20, uh, 20, uh, uh, in 2020 and 2021, I receive them in a week, even when they were coming from the EU. So we, customers and, and residents in the UK, we can already see the, the delays and also the, uh, the additional cost that this, um, this uh, Brexit situation is incurring without having a proper um, bilateral trade agreement in place between um, the UK and uh, the EU. So also another point is that the UK has got some pretty um, um, weak border uh, controls at the um, at the you know entry points in the UK. Uh, for example, a few weeks ago, the Court of Justice of the European Union sentenced the UK to a very hefty fine. Um, the moment the, the amount is not uh, uh, is not set in stone at the moment, but we're looking at several billions of, Euro, of, of euros apparently. Um, so the European Court of Justice sentenced the UK because between 2011 and 2017, when the UK was still in one of the 28 member states of the EU, a lot of Chinese goods flooded the European markets through the UK because the UK borders and customs were not doing their job at the entry points in the UK to stop these uh, cheaply imported, these cheap Chinese made uh, uh, garments and shoes and, and clothes. And they were not also collecting the correct amount of custom duties, VAT um, and other uh, charges on these imported Chinese goods. So this is a tangible example that sadly at the moment, the controls at the UK borders are not strong enough um, to be able to um, process and assess in a systematic manner every good that comes into the UK to ensure that um, it is compliant with the exhaustion of rights regime. And so this is even more true 
with um, uh, rights which are protected by copyright, not by trademarks, because copyright is a, a not registered right, so there is no database of copyright. Therefore, um, how can a uh, custom official know that it has to seize these books sold by Amazon and which enter the, uh, the UK uh, from the EU uh, because the right owner has not provided the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the UK with, with um, um, any, any IP rights to be able to copyright to, uh, to import these, uh, these books into the UK. So, so these, um, basically these weaknesses, these structural weaknesses uh, in terms of um, a, a weak manufacturing sector. I mean, don't get me wrong, the UK has got some uh, wonderful qualities, especially in terms of the, the, um, the strength of its services. The UK is, is a fantastic exporter of services and also digital goods. But in terms of products, in terms of tangible physical goods, then uh, especially if you compare it to other players like Germany, China, or the US, um, the UK is not a, is a, is a weak manufacturing country. So I think that it is important for the future of the UK that the government and the other stakeholders and just be able to do an assessment of their own strengths and weaknesses and um, also come back to the UK, uh, sorry, to the European Union authorities as soon as possible because the situation cannot go on for a long time. Um, so revert back to the EU officials as soon as possible to start negotiations for a bilateral trade agreement between the UK and the 27 member states of the EU. It is imperative um, for the UK to start those negotiations as soon as possible once it has you know, done its ass assessment in a, a, a manner which is impartial of its strength, its weaknesses, and, um, and also made its list of priorities of what needs to be achieved through such future uh, bilateral trade agreements with the EU and then get working as soon as possible. I really don't think that the approach of the UK government, which is let's take a wait and see approach, uh, in particular in relation to this exhaustion of rights um, issue, because we've got all the time in the world and also we want to have some, a bit of distance with you know, what's happening in Northern Ireland and, and also with our relationships with, uh, with the EU, you know, with all the fishermen issues and stuff. No, they can't wait. It is a matter of uh, uh, survival for the UK um, as a, um, as a, you know, as a powerhouse um, for for a, a, a international trade to really get hit the ground running and start doing those negotiations for a, a, a bilateral trade agreement with the EU as, as soon as possible. Let's not forget that when Canada did the same, um, went through the same process with the EU a few years ago. These negotiations went on for almost 10 years, right? From the moment they started negotiating, Canada and the EU, and the moment they signed, it took at least eight years. So the, the UK doesn't have one second to lose and needs to really get cracking. And also, uh, and this is why this assessment of its strengths and weaknesses are, is so important, because there's also quite a lot of you know, bad blood in the sense that the EU is annoyed um, that the UK left because they only want to have, you know, um, they, they want to pick and, and, and choose and cherry pick what they want from the EU, uh, uh, but for example, definitely not freedom of people, of, of persons, of citizens. Well, so there's bad blood, okay? So they also have to overcome this um, negative bias that um, EU uh, officials and representatives will have, which is that the UK will only deal, uh, we will only strike a deal which is in its advantage, which is that um, it only wants uh, uh, basically a free movement of goods and services and capital, but nothing else. So there's a lot of work to do here for the UK to position itself in, 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 a, in an astute, and um, and strategic manner in order to regain 
its position as a um, as a strong um, as, as a strong uh, uh, basically um, exporting country. And um, at the moment, what I'm seeing is is uh, is quite. Um, uh, it's, it's, it's not what I would expect the best, I mean, the best scenario. So do you have any questions? Does anyone have any questions? Let me check whether... Hi, Stacy. Sorry, I, I wasn't sure that, uh, that you managed to get in. So it's lovely to, uh, to, see, to see you in. So if you have any questions, if, yeah, sure. Go ahead. Do you want to? Yeah, sure. Um, so if... if um... A company wants to license uh, a copyrighted good from, um, well, it wouldn't have to be from an EU company, but for example, from an EU company for distribution in the U in the UK territory. Uh, would you be able to? Would there be a problem in having a contractual provision in your license that prohibits? The UK, the EU licensor, uh, from restricting other parties in the EU to selling into the UK, because that would seem to contradict would. the principle. So there would be a problem. Yes, yes, and there how, would. Be. How would how would that how would so you couldn't have a separate contractual restriction? Well, basically, it would be difficult for this. Um, counterparty to stop any uh, uh, some third parties from uh, uh, parallel importing its products in the UK because mm -hmm. uh, as I explained the um, UK plus regime is uh, is 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 uh, ground is basically is grounded on the on the on the concept that EEA goods can freely enter the UK but the re the, the reciprocal is not true anymore the UK goods cannot freely uh, uh, float into the EEA now. Yeah. So, but would that? So, but would the EU licensor be able to restrict its licensees in the EU contractually? So yes. Yes. Of course. Contractually, it could actually uh, basically uh, go against, like, decide to actually, um, yeah, exactly, go against the default scenario. Which yeah. is that parallel imports from the EEA to the UK uh, is completely legal, and therefore that no EU rights holder could stop um, its its goods placed on the uh, firstly on the on the on the EU market from entering the UK. However, in the scenario you mentioned, you said other people, so I wasn't sure whether these yeah. were yeah, yeah. like but third they, parties they, who have if, nothing to do they, with the. Yeah, so if they had a contractual relationship with the party, they could stop them. Yes. Um, and there wouldn't, there isn't something in the in the concept of exhaustion of rights or in the legislation that trumps the contractual restriction then and says it wouldn't be effective. Uh, uh, no, no, I don't think no. so. No, no, of course the contract okay. would override uh, right. this. Uh, um, but but then again, as I said, it might be difficult to enter into such contracts with third parties because. Uh, this EU rights holder might not know or might not have any uh, uh, okay. basically bargaining power with any all of these third parties uh, uh, which uh, may um, import into the UK uh, its EU uh, uh, first pl placed products. And it seems that's the only that's the only solution is a contractual restriction really. Well yes as, well, as I was mentioning before it creates some red tape it creates some uh, additional legal costs and um, and it's not ideal. I no, mean, no, definitely not. OK, thank you. My pleasure. Right. I think that uh, we are done for the day. Um, if Stacey, you let me have a look at um, um, YouTube uh, um, uh, attendees. No, we all good. Great. Lovely. So uh, thank you for your time. And um, I uh, yeah, look forward to seeing, ho seeing you hopefully at the next session of our live webinars. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye, Bye Alan. Bye, Stacey. Bye-bye, everyone.